Hello and welcome to the T Force LCS Rundown, episode 32, take two. Uh, sorry, uh, everybody, for the minor technical difficulties. For those of you out there in lovely podcast land, you won't have to deal with such things. This will be the first time you're hearing it, and we welcome you. For those of you out in Twitch land, we apologize Hello for our ever constant to uh, technical LCS difficulties that we seem to be able to find here. Episode 32, and still saying, uh, staying consistent. So you can at least give us that. So, to repeat what has already been said, we find ourselves here in quarterfinals. Uh, this is Mott Ganorum. I am joined this week by Greg Credible Mushroom Russo. and uh, Sipa! Now I'm going to give you a chance. We're plowing through this. We're making up for time. So, uh, let's hop right in this to give us a, uh, an overview for what we saw this week. For those of you out in podcast land, we are recording this shortly after 9 p.m. on Sunday, so we have not seen Najin White Sealed versus OMG. So cast your minds back to uh, the information you have for today. We have Samsung White on TSM, Blue on Cloud9, Royal Club on EDG. So that's what we'll be talking about this week. Um, so let's hop right into it. We're going to start out talking about TSM versus Samsung White. Uh, the Eagle is struck down. We have have a, a North American team down. Uh, TSM failed to defeat uh, Samsung White in a best of five. They were able to take game three uh, out from under them uh, in a pretty glorious performance, uh, if I do say so myself. Feeling you, you a little bit better. You will say that yourself. I will say that. I'm feeling a little bit better about TSM, um, but Are they did you? fall short. Uh, and let's just hop right into that. So how do you guys feel that this uh, the series overall went before we start drilling down into the individual games? I feel uh, worse for TSM. You feel worse? Yeah. Explain. Explain yourself. What it ultimately came down to is, especially when you contrast it to the Cloud9 series, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, TSM played scared the whole series. They we, just had no... Uh, no fight, no challenge. Um, the game that they did win, I wouldn't say glorious fashion is not how I exactly how I would characterize it. Uh, it we White, did again is the best team I think in the entire tournament right now, uh, at least record wise certainly. So I don't blame them for doing poorly, but it was just doing poorly. Like they were just afraid to take risks. They were just abandoning objectives bef- without even fighting for them. We did hear the fear in some of the post-game interviews. I mean, you you obviously can't go into a game against a team like Samsung White and not give them the respect that they deserve. And for a team that, I mean, let's be let's be honest here, really only came together in the the last couple of weeks of the summer split, if I'm not mistaken, right? What did, does anybody remember specifically what week Lust Boy came into the picture? It was spring split, I thought. Spring split? I may have been wrong there, but uh, you know, you've got a you've got a team who's who's still kind of coming together, still trying to find find their way and and their synergy. Um, they obviously have done spectacular for I think what definitely for what I called. Uh, and what I thought yeah. was going to be their performance. I would agree. You gotta I was give them... impressed by these games. Sure. I was impressed. Uh, I think the first two games, I think Greg is completely right. I think the TSM played scared. Uh, they were they were totally dominated. Um, they had no objective control. They did not team fight. And Samsung did the same thing over and over again, which was find a small lead and snowball into a big lead and win the game, which is you know what you expect from them as a team. They took the games um, in really convincing fashion, slow and steady. But I will say that I disagree in the sense that game three was really good for TSM. They made an aggressive level one play and got a small lead off of it, and then snowballed that, just as Samsung did against them, into a sizable league and had pretty dominant objective control uh, and were really decisive in their team fighting, which was not something we saw from Samsung in the third game. Despite Samsung having pretty solid vision control all of game three, um, TSM had such a sizable lead that it didn't really matter, and they were able to initiate a couple team fights um, that if they had been even might have failed them, but because they had the lead that they had accrued, over the early game, they they won pretty handily. Um, and I will say that we also saw in Game 4, TSM playing really well uh, rotationally, despite the fact that they once again were set back in the early game and uh, were 
we're honestly we're behind the entire game. It wasn't much of a back and forth. TSM still played really well as far as objectives. They never let an objective go for free. They always traded. Um, I mean, they never really contested. They didn't go to Dragon to fight Samsung Blue. But I think that's the smart choice. They don't want to fight face to face when they have such a such a substantial gold lead. What they wanted to do was you know was trade objectives and wait till the late game. And despite the fact that Samsung still outplayed them in the late game, I will say that um, TSM looks better than they ever have. And I'm impressed that they even got a game off of Samsung White. I mean, I, I was hoping they were going to be able to take it to five games. I think especially after seeing game three and seeing the way in which they were able to beat Samsung White. I mean, I, I think the deeper, the more analytical mind, which I am not, would take a look at the pick bands, take a look at some of the early plays made by Samsung White, especially some of the action around Dragon, and say that, to some degree, Samsung White was almost disrespecting TSM and not really taking them seriously. And, you know, maybe after the first two games, that was merited. But TSM, you know, we've seen in, in North America is definitely not the kind of team you can do that against. Uh, and I think they were certainly able to prove that you know, in game three by pulling off that win. But my hopes was that they would be able to, <coughs> excuse me, carry that over into game four and really be able to uh, take this to a five game series and have that under their belt. I had no disillusions at this point that they would be able to take all, uh, all, you know, the rest of the three games and actually move on. Um, but, you know, I, I was hoping for at least five but, you know, I, I saw a lot of great action out of Lust Boy. Uh, I was really uh, satisfied with his level of thresh play. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's, definitely. He's been stepping up. And I'd say on a, sure. on a mechanical level, Lust Boy was a god those games. I'd say Mata still outplayed him in terms of vision control and map movement. But, I mean, Lust Boy was unstoppable mechanically. He was getting the picks that his team needed. He was playing team fights perfectly. Really excellent play coming out from him. What gets me really excited about, though, is, is this TSM. Uh, going forward, <laughs> going in back into North America uh, after having to deal with Samsung White. I mean, I, I don't think anybody looks at TSM right now and says, you know, poo on them. You know, they didn't do good. They couldn't beat Samsung White in a best of five. I think everybody looks at it and goes, wow, one game. That's pretty good, guys. Like, which is a little, which is a little sad because I mean, this is these are the top teams from North America, and we're like, oh yay, one game. But at the same time, I think that. They pretty much set themselves up to be the number one team in North America next season, especially given all the drama in NA with uh, roster swaps and people leaving teams. Oh, God. We are going to mm -hmm. have some stuff to talk about in future episodes. We, uh, there has been a lot of, of changes going on, even you know in between episodes here. Uh, we haven't covered anything yet, but that's just because we have a very long offseason, ladies and gentlemen. So <laughs> Yeah, we're going to have plenty of time to talk about we're it. And gonna, a lot of these yeah. changes aren't aren't final, nor will they be the last changes we're going to see. Oh, God, no. So yeah, it's probably better to just tackle them all at once once the picture gets a little clearer. Sure, sure. So, I mean, overall, uh, before we kind of look at, at individual games here, I mean, I think TSM performed, maybe I would say, to par of what I expected. Um, better than what I expected. Definitely. Yeah, best best case scenario for most sets of expectations. And I mean, even just listening to the crowd, Korea screaming TSM that was in cool. that game three. I mean, it's <laughs> like, I don't know if you're Samsung White, how do you feel about that? I mean, they did get their due respect when they pulled off big plays. They got the crowd going like any big play would. But to hear, you know, TSM fans amidst the crowd in your home country, there's that's got to burn a little bit. That's got to suck. I mean, you, you think they got to be used to it. They they haven't always been like the top seed. They're not always the fan favorite. And I think that uh, TSM, <laughs> not TSM, or white. white. I was about to say white. Wow. TSM's always been the fan. God, I wish not. But yeah, TSM is sadly <laughs> always the American favorite, right? But no, white. I mean. Come on, I mean, they they shat the bed so bad last year at Worlds. The second they hear that, like, disparaging chance or just even chance for the enemy team, they just, I think it's just that much more reason for them to take the game seriously. And I think they came into game four, like, and then I think that TSM played really well game four, but I think White also really stepped it up. I think they just, 
they came in with a vengeance after losing that game. They <laughs> took the gloves off and just went to town. But at, at the same time, from what I've seen out of the Korean culture of gameplay, uh, I don't think they're going to be too happy about this. To lose a game in the way that they did, mm-hmm. that's that's going to burn a little bit. That's going to hit you in the ego, you know, to some degree. And I think, um, you know, definitely their coaching staff is is going to be really reining in on that game and using that as a focal point. I mean, we've seen it. At least I I believe we saw it out of Cloud Nine. Um, sometimes losing a game for these top teams is the best thing that can happen. Uh, as long as it doesn't end up costing him a series, because you finally do get that point of criticism that you can kind of look back at and say, "All right, well, we we lost this game, and here's what we did wrong." So, who knows? Maybe Samsung White kind of uses this and takes out their fury on uh, Blue. Which, spoiler alert, <laughs> that's not the Blue of Cloud Nine we'll be talking about. Yeah, <laughs> joy, oh joy, from that series. Uh, yes. Do we want to move on to the Cloud9 series? Cause... Sure, let's, let's yeah, talk let's Cloud9 versus Blue. So so excited, and the series did not disappoint. Yeah, it was, a, it was an amazing, amazing series. I will say, so for those of you who don't know, Cloud9 won Game 1 and then proceeded to lose uh, three games consecutively. But uh, Game yeah, 1 well, coming in. Yeah, let's revise that. Did not win, dominated Game 1. Like, it it was amazing. It was like watching a Challenger's... Uh, tournament game where like the number one seed versus the number one challenger seed <laughs> the lcs I, I versus challenger that's how big the skill disparity was they did an early invade they i think they picked up a double kill and uh i think it was just two kills i think one went to lost boy or sorry i'm looking two is double monster. uh <laughs> one went to sneaky and one uh didn't one go to lemon i think first blood went to lemon that i may be wrong that. on that I mean, so they, they, they picked up a double and if they like never took their foot off the gas there, it completely threw off blues rhythm. They never really got going. And it was like watching white versus TSM, except this time cloud nine was the one doing well. I'm going to say if sneaky didn't have the biggest erection in the world coming off of that stage <laughs> for the first game, then he is not a human being. Because to say that you went 15-0 and 0 against a top Korean team on a world stage in their hometown, that is a pretty big, uh, pretty big accomplishment. Oh, yeah. And, and I think Sneaky has pretty much set himself up as the number one American AD carry, like without, without a doubt, after those games. He, he played well in every single one of those games. I mean, it as was, good as Wild Turtle is, I don't know how you could dispute his status now because sneaky has always been a relatively quiet ad carry yeah because well, all of cloud nine is kind of quiet in a lot of yeah, ways and their and their strategy in season three was not a, all about sneaky it was all about like everybody and right. team fighting and sneaky really yeah. really never got the chance to shine but since we've shifted to this ad carry focused meta sneaky has set himself aside as just just an incredibly dominant player and has amazing performances consistently, like always does well. Even Never the games they lost, game. he was like usually one of the few players on Cloud9 that's consistently doing well. I don't think he had a single bad game. No, and he was always ahead of Deft, like always. Mm-hmm. Consistently at least 10 to 12 CS ahead and like putting a ton of pressure on him constantly. And I mean, a lot of that is Sneaky did pick a lot more aggressive champs. We saw, you know, Corky, we saw Lucian, we saw Graves. Um, you know, just much more aggressive laners, but at the same time, he just he played those people perfectly. He mm-hmm. pushed in, pressed the early game advantage, and in game one, it was like it was all they needed, and they they took that first blood and they snowballed it into a huge lead. And Sneaky just looked untouchable. Yeah, we saw some good performance out of Balls as well. Um, some really clutch plays, uh, especially you know game one on Rise. Uh, I was very impressed. By it to say the least uh, he was always kind of one of those champion or one of those players who you kind of can't leave alone and disrespect and when you've got sneaky being sneaky in that fashion in the bottom lane you you kind of have to let balls go and, and that's sort of what happened um, I mean he was doing one-on-ones uh, later on in the game uh, who did he catch out I'm trying to think of the play uh, yes Caught out Dare on Jace and just completely uh, Acorn Nidalee jumped away 
uh, as he just completely rolled in and just flattened him. And then I think they <laughs> collapsed for an ace. Uh, and it was just, it was solid performance. It was a very solid performance by Balls. But the one person I was a little disappointed in was High. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, specifically, about- his shot calls for the most part were very strong. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it, it, especially in game one, the small advantages that Samsung was able to pick up was because they were catching out high left and right. Mm-hmm. I mean, just completely soloed out. Uh, a point I was, you know, making off air earlier that I'd love to dive into a little bit more. Um, you know, time can be limited when we're we're talking about games the day of. I'd love to go back and, and kind of review. Was this just Samsung Blue being a more dominant team and focusing on their shot caller, and that's why it, it gave the perception of High not performing as well? Or was this High making legitimate mistakes? And I think, I think that's that's definitely a question Cloud9 is going to be answering uh, in the coming weeks here now that they're done. I'm reasonably sure that this is a little bit of both, because the thing is is that High played really well in Game 1. Obviously, he had a lead, and he used it well. But um, he was caught pretty consistently by thresh hooks like in every game and uh, outperformed as far as in a lot of team fights as far as vision went. We saw a lot of people flashing over the wall to deny him his Z ult for those couple and vulnerability frames that like really would have saved his life. We saw him flash and then just get stunned immediately. Uh, I remember him flashing in to try to send her all and just immediately getting hooked. Uh, and I think a lot of these things that Hyde does, he could totally pull off against uh, a lower team. But when he's playing against a team like Blue, um, who knows that the only way this team fight goes south is if, you know, high gets his ultimate off and gets a right. gets a pick before like a real team fight breaks out. They just they're gonna throw that hook where high is gonna appear. They're gonna throw it every time because they know that if worse comes to worse, they miss the hook, but they're denying high the opportunity to jump in. And high just played into it every time. So I just think high to a certain degree got outplayed. There was a lot of like next level predictions from um, blue as a team, but at the same time, high also never really won lane. Like was consistently outperformed by Dade, uh, and we didn't. We didn't really see, despite the fact that the shot calling was good, him as an individual player I was never really impressed by. And let's well, let's talk a little bit. Let's get into the weeds, of specifically matches two and four. And this was something that I, like, I'm watching it happen, and I'm like, what is going on here? The champion picks for Cloud9, particularly high, were very strange. Uh, he picked Zed. Uh, that's not really a high champ. I mean, he's okay with it, but they were, so, like, in I the mean, past, his Syndra was open and would have been a better choice in this situation. He has other champs as well that are much stronger, I felt. And then match four, he got forced on, not forced, but he picked Talon into a Yasuo. Eh? Okay, so match four, I completely agree. The Talon pick was out of nowhere. But High Zed used to be like a thing of legend. You used to never let High get Zed. High used to be the best. I mean, he used to shut down everybody in North America. Um, and stunned him well for him so far on the international stage, but in these games, it, it was awful. Like there his just Zed so many bad. counters to his Zed, and and Blue built every single one of them onto each champion. Like, and I just there's I mean Zed is great, but he's very much a one trick pony, and there's lots of counters against that trick. I think a lot of highs picks. I think a lot of the focus for Cloud9 was on um, was on the bot lane and getting sneaky ahead just because of his dominant performance. And I think a lot of what High did was he wanted to pick champions who could win lane and who could farm safely. Um, and Zed's a champion who's always going to be able to farm safely and who can pretty definitively 1v1 win lane. Um, and that way they don't have to focus jungle pressure on High, right? Like High can get out with the shadow, High can farm with the, the shuriken in the shadow, and he'll be safe in that lane no matter what. And then transitioning into late game, he's always going to hopefully always be able to kill Deft or at least one person on the enemy team, and if not, he can split push. So that's my theory as to why they picked Zed, but then Hai just screwed it up. He was consistently behind, uh, he never really did anything in team fights. he was over-aggressive with the plays, despite the fact that he had like not quite enough items. Um, like I was saying earlier, he got hooked consistently, or f- mm-hmm. his alt was consistently, they would flash out of vision to deny it, and then he would just look like a fool and die immediately. Or just yeah, QSS he, it on Twitch, and he, Twisted and, Fate had, uh, Twisted Fate and Rumble both build Zanyas. He ended that game uh, one ten and one. Yeah, and you can't be split pushing when you're one ten and one against no, Twisted Fate and Twitch. Yeah, and that's a team that one you know split pushing is not going to be particularly effective on because both those characters can just appear anywhere. Got a teleport and, rumble. 
Yeah, and a teleport rumble. And then on top of that, I mean, he's he's so far behind. He's still Zed, so like he has the potential without a QSS to maybe kill Deft, just because Zed's damage is so absurd, and because obviously uh, marksmen are just so squishy. But even then, like High just wasn't good enough to pull it off. And I think even at one in ten, he still should have been able to solo kill if an AD carry came to his lane. But anyone else comes to that lane, and he can't do anything. So Blue would have to make some serious misplays in order to let him split push. Yeah, and I mean, the the question, and I don't, to be honest, I mean, I've, I've kind of been thinking about it as we've been talking here. The big question that I have, and this is total speculation, this is total me just throwing fuel on probably a fire that won't ever be lit, is there was a lot of emphasis for high to perform. Uh, on the world stage and it was shown in interviews management said it and take that all with a grain of salt but you could point i think you could make an argument that maybe highest performance is is part of what hindered cloud nine a little bit i mean if if you go back and watch all of their games cloud nine played pretty well but if high played more like hide or high what was the what would have been the result and Cloud Nine's never had a roster change. I don't every know. Every other don't, well, every other team has. And I'm just I'm just putting this out there. I'm just putting this out there. But when you come out and you say, "Hi was this not the guy only matters. problem." As much as you shouted out balls, balls did not do terribly well. I I mean, his rise on the first game, of course, was awesome. But match two, it was Maokai one and six. I don't know why they put balls on Maokai. I haven't seen a good Maokai game out of him yet. It's just not aggressive enough of a champion for him. He needs to be on a more threatening champion. When they did put him on Rumble, uh, much like most of the Rumbles in Worlds that people keep picking, they just (laughs) focused on him, and he just got way behind. He was 1-5 in in match 3. Yeah, and that but the thing about Rumble is that he's so good just with level scaling that even his alt can change a team fight even if he doesn't have that many items. But I, I agree that uh, and I think for both North American teams, a lot of the times we saw their top laners getting caught out solo and just dying, dying to uh, to ganks. And I think this is just a lot of the the Korean teams knowing how much of a part Rise and Rumble specifically play in team fights, and also knowing that like their entire ability to team fight is based around Rumble being dead. Because if Rumble teleports into a team fight and ults, it changes the whole flow of a team fight. And that's right. just I think good on Blue for for seeing that Balls is that potential threat and seeing Rumble is just a, a really powerful champion and shutting shutting balls down but i don't think balls was uh balls was just not ready for it like the one time he didn't die to like surprise ganks was when he had a ward in the, like a ward specifically in top lane in the bush closest to the turret where he saw both people waiting that was the only time he played cautiously enough to avoid a gank at least from what i saw sure but i don't know i mean it, i have questions i mean cloud nine has always kind of been this poster child of the North American team I did expect a little bit more out of them and I watch games with no spoilers on so I watch game one and went holy shit mm-hmm. is this about to happen <laughs> like and the final game I see... mean they almost took two games they almost took two games All right, and game four you know was a lot more interesting to watch it uh, was a bit free if you haven't watched it yet two words <laughs> man ace race uh, that and uh, fish in a barrel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. The uh, the there was a dragon fight uh, pretty early on which in the game, hilarious. which ended up in uh, sneaky guarding the exit to dragon as heart on Nami uh, slowly got torn apart by dragon. Then sneaky just manages to kill him uh, and then take dragon. But you know, past that, the game kind of just folded. It's like it this up, whole so. team fight unfurls and hearts just stuck he can't go anywhere <laughs> and as soon as sneaky realizes that he's got the dragon aggro but <laughs> that if he moves waited. like half an inch to the left <laughs> it'll switch he just does it and then sits there and watches heart slowly get worn down by the dragon yeah. finishes him off and then to take the dragon on top of that it's just salt in the wound man I mean, say what you will, but we pretty much know that the whole reason why Cloud9 lost that game was because Meteos uh, ended up playing the SKT Lee Sin skin. So, you know, that's really how that game broke down. Well, the reason they lost is that for some reason they <laughs> shot at Spirit's Rengar instead of the Nexus, which Ugh. is a very questionable decision. But I guess good on Spirit for being very distracting. Oh my God. <laughs> 
that was a, a a great game for Rengar. I mean that. I hate hate watching good Rengars because it just. I love watching good apart. Rengars. No one in North America can play Rengar, and that that's guy, why I don't like watching. Can. Good. It's so good. That's why I don't like watching good Rengars because that means we're losing. <laughs> he's, just, he's always in the right place. When a good Rengar is like winning, it's because they're always in the right place at the right time, and it's like that six that sixth sense you develop as a professional jungler, where you just know where the enemy jungler is going to be and where you need to be. Because the only thing Rengar can do pre six is counter gank, and right. it's just. Oh, it's just awesome. Yeah, I, I love watching Rengar because it's all There's, map awareness. It's just the, the jungler that has to be aware of where everyone is at at all times. And so I just think it's like the pinnacle of jungle ability to be able to play Rengar well. At least pre-6. Post-6, it's Rengar. You, you show up wherever you want to show up. Right. And it's there's not enough pink words in the world for a Rengar and Twitch combo. No. <laughs> so... Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's Cloud9 versus versus Blue and... I mean, it it is what it is. North America is out at this point. Um, you know, we can smile upon TSM, and I think a lot of people are going to be kind of indifferent on Cloud9, but I think the one thing we do kind of know from this is the other North American teams are really going to have to get their shit together because these are two world-class teams. Yeah, I mean, they... Yeah. I want to reference to something I saw on the GGC forums earlier today. Sure. Like how, oh my gosh, the gap between Korea and the West is so big. Uh, no. Are you kidding me? After this series, these two series, and after group stages, more than anything, I think the gap between North America and Korea is smaller than it's ever been. And it's a trajectory that means if you like follow how it's gone, it's probably going to get even smaller next year. It has nothing to do with like, oh, this Korean team didn't make it in the Worlds. That Korean team didn't make it in the Worlds. Samsung's blue and white are two of the best teams in Korea, hands down. And Nagin and White Shield's no slouch either. And North American teams beat all three of them at least one game. So, you know what? If you want to say anything, say that like... Maybe Europe specifically, the gap isn't as large. But even then, <laughs> Alliance did have that awesome game in groups. Uh, they I just think, happened right. to lose to a Brazilian team. <laughs> well, we'll never talk about that again because that's embarrassing. I will talk about that every show until the next <laughs> split. <laughs> Kaboom! <laughs> Get drunk. Right. Well, I, I don't mean, think there's the gap is as big. I don't think the gap is as big as it's used to be. I the think Korean we're definitely... teams aren't bulletproof. They're just not. I mean, no, and they're definitively they're not better. KT bulletproof. Oh, no, are they arrowproof? <laughs> oh my god, what these teams aren't even in the finals. I Who mean, are you making these puns for? <laughs> yes, SKT was dominant. <laughs> Who are you pandering to? <laughs> SKT was dominant season three, but let's not forget season two. Korea did not win. Got beat by TPA. Season mm-hmm. four. Uh, the 2014 season, what we're in right now, we may have another Korean team winning, but it hasn't been a flawless performance, and I'm not even sure that a Korean team is going to win the finals because Starhorn is my personal pick. Ooh, well, that's as good a segue as there ever will be. Uh, let's talk about Starhorn Royal, which, by the way, explain this to me because I've, I've never pretended to be an expert on anything not North America or Europe. When did we start calling royal club starhorn why can't we just call them royal club is this two different things it was it was a rebranding so they used to be royal club and now they are starhorn royal club i think i don't know if they were bought by another organization but i'm pretty sure they changed hands at some point and then now they are starhorn yeah something sponsor related or starhorn royal club just like when tsm was tsm snapdragon Right. For that, that oh. one or two splits where they actually yeah. had to be referred to as TSM Snapdragon and not just TSM. <laughs> it is it is um, stupid. It's a terrible, terrible thing that it, uh, Professional League of Legends just has to wean itself off of. You can have team sponsors, but team sponsors, stop screwing with the team names. Cloud9 HyperX. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that's all that that was, is, is, a, is a change of hands, either in ownership or a change of sponsorships. But, uh, You're not helping it's... anybody! What? <laughs> Jesus! You're not it's even Royal Club. There we go. Royal, Royal Club. Club. Just call EDG. Club. Yes. Uh, so basically, th- this series is what I like to call the Uzi and Pal show. <laughs> because it pretty much was a one-man show. It was Uzi and, like, everybody else. 
even the games that Starhorn lost. So I was glad to see that this went to five. Yeah, I think it was really back and forth, and I think a lot of that is to do with um, when you and Clear Love on EDG were playing well, they can pretty much carry a game, and they could shut down Uzi Eye and all the team fights are Uzi. God, I'm gonna that's forever gonna trip me up. Um, but in game <laughs> one, isn't great up in the city. <laughs> for in game one, uh, Uzi just farmed bot lane for like. 12, 15 minutes, and he was carried through the early game by the rest of his team, who pretty much were like, okay, we'll let your AD carry go farm top, you let Uzi go farm in the bottom, we know he's going to dump you late game, and he did. And then meanwhile, the rest of the team got control of the bottom side of the map uh, and was pretty much on top of keeping pretty much on top of uh, keeping dragon control and shutting down you um, the EDG's mid laner, which really is what snowballed them into the mid game and allowed Uzi, Uzi I to utilize the lead he had accrued solo farming. But it was a, once he got there, I mean, <laughs> that's exactly what you want. When you have any player, AD carry, whatever, off in a lane farming like that, you want them to have the kind of impact that Uzi had. He just came in there and wrecked everything because he just has so much gold and then and spe specifically in the first dragon team fight where they really got a lead i mean uzi did, was, was still farming for the majority of that team fight and came in having not backed to buy items with the pickaxe adorns blade and boots and like just cleaned up solo killed you you and like while the rest of his team just plowed through the rest of eeg getting them another five kills and like Uzi did damage to maybe two people in that game fight, but he solo killed their mid laner. A mid laner who had gone back and bought like real items at that point in the game, whereas Uzi's on like hasn't even finished his first item. Has the money to finish it, but just hasn't gone back yet. Because mm -hmm. he's just too busy farming. It was I was thoroughly impressed by Uzi, especially like any time um Starhorn was winning, Uzi was ahead. Hugely ahead. And they built whole team comps. I mean the Lulu mid. Uh, between Insect and Uzi, that entire game, all Lulu had to do was all somebody, and then she could disappear for the rest of the team fight. Just that like 600 or 800 extra bonus health was enough to get the Kha'Zix or the Lucian pick to plow through the enemy team. No problem. Well, that's, so, that's what was pretty much on display in the game where they won. Um, the casters were talking about the fact that Uzi had, after the the second loss in Game 4, had like separated himself from everyone else and away from the team. They weren't sure if, you know, his he had given up or he was dejected, his morale was shot. No, he was just hulking up. Because he went wild. I think he was like fifteen and one, sixteen and one, uh, by the end of that game. Just uh, an unending killing spree on Twitch. I don't know, I mean it did go to five, and we haven't seen that entirely. I mean, is are you really that confident in Uzi? I mean, Greg, you you picked them, um, and I assume when you say pick, you mean you pick them to go all the way. Uh, yeah. Do you really think his performance alone is going to be able to get them through the next bout, either against OMG or White Shield, um, which we'll, we'll eventually end up talking about, even though the games haven't happened yet? But then again, you know, against either blue or white, uh, more than likely white. Uh, I think it's definitely going to be a hard game. It'll absolutely go to five. I think they have a very strong chance, and I, uh, I, I don't want to just say white's going to win everything because as cool as white is, I would hate to have, like, the team that's the obvious choice to win everything. Right, because that's boring. Last year, yeah, I was kind of dull watching those finals after especially the game one when SKT was just stopping. Yeah, it wasn't so that's a very not fun. Final. So I'm throwing my love behind Royal Cloud. I liked them last year as well. Uh, this year, I think they're looking even better. I think the ultimate challenge as to whether or not they win everything is actually not on Uzi. Uzi will be Uzi. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest issue is ironically Insec. Yeah, I was going to ask you about how you felt about his performance. By the numbers, you know, it was pretty pretty mediocre. Uh, but, I mean, do you really... I mean, we know 
as we'll call it, you know, people who follow primarily North America and European scenes, we only know of insect on a on a day game to game basis by the legend. <laughs> you know, right. he's got his own signature Lee Sin move named after him from his ridiculous play. But at this top level where you kind of have people who know that and respect that, I mean, how well has he been doing thus far? Well, the main issue with him is he's got the legend. However, people, uh, especially at this level, the Korean teams at this level, are going to understand the legend. EDG understood the legend, and they had an answer for it every single time. I think he Mm -hmm. successfully insect somebody once the entire series. Every other time he tried it, it was either dodged or countered for a kill. He needs to and that's that's diversify. not even that's not even remotely acceptable. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, not, it'd be, I mean, it'd be cool if it worked every time, but it's not. He needs to predict that and then go, okay. If I go in and try the the insect move and it doesn't work out, I have to get my head around what's next. You know what I mean? It would be it would be ridiculous well, because anybody does that move. Everybody does that move now. That's literally the move that everybody who plays, even in solo queue and like <laughs> silver or higher, everybody does that move. Maybe not as well as he does, but you can't rely on that as, you know, you're, it's, he's not a one-trick pony. So he's not just that move, despite the fact that that is like one of the most important parts of playing Lee Sin these days is being able to kick someone back into your team. Um, and we'll say, though, that he does, he's a mechanical god, obviously. He's always been good, um, but he is at this point... Now that you're playing against Korean teams who have junglers that are definitively better than him in, in just about every respect except for maybe mechanics, that that cheeky kind of stuff isn't going to work anymore. He needs to be way more aware of the map rotations. He needs to be way more cautious about going in for plays like that. He needs to respect the people he's playing against. And I don't know if that's what we're going to see out of Insect. Like He's always been kind of a cocky player, and I think that... Uh, when it when it comes to playing against Korean teams and and teams that he used to play against all the time, I think specifically he's either going to you know chill out and respect that and play his best, or he's just going to try to show them up, you know, like with a big show of pride and try to play out of his mind, and it's going to fail and it's going to bite him in the butt. All right, so check this well, out. If okay. you go down to the specifics and drill in, the first game they won, and in that game, Clear Love was actually on Lee Sin. Match two, they gave Insect Lee Sin. He went 4-3-8, and eight, but Uzi went 14-1. and one. So that's what the real carry was there. The third match, Insect again on Lee Sin, 3-7-11. Not great, and Uzi was held to eight kills. Match four, they gave it to Insect again, 2-5-4, and four, with Uzi completely shut down, 0-1-1. Match five, they give... Insect the option to have Lee Sin. It wasn't banned out and it wasn't picked away from him. But he went Jarvin the fourth and actually did really well on it. One one and ten. And he was very tactical with his use of the ult. And I think maybe the fact that he switched things up and went with the Jarvin and pulled that out on the fifth match is a sign that he can evolve. And if he can evolve and be less predictable and if not follow the rotations of a Korean jungler add some other kind of utility, play a jungler that adds some kind of unique uh, advantage like a Jarvan does with the Cataclysm, then I, I think there's a lot to be said for them having a pretty serious shot at winning. Well, uh, for the sake of time, you know, looking into tomorrow's matchup, which will eventually decide their fate uh, next Sunday, we've got Nash and White Shield against OMG, and uh, a different OMG than what we've seen thus far. Yeah. yeah, so OMG coming into this for the record, for those of you who don't know already, has swapped out Dada7, their support, and one of arguably probably the worst player at Worlds, yes, worse than the Kaboom players in Dark Passage, <laughs> for Cloud, who is a very good player, but is known for being absolutely 100% toxic and horrible to his teammates. Um, what does this mean for the team? Who knows? Hopefully Cloud will perform <laughs> and they will make it out of quarterfinals or he'll be a giant jerk and after they lose one game as I'm pretty sure they're going to lose the first game uh, he'll, he'll come to North on, America. Yeah, he'll, he'll go <laughs> on kill. Well, yeah, there we go. Where do all failed players from other regions come? North America. Yay. But uh, Cloud is a, absurdly good. 
if if you want to go back and watch the post game interviews, which if you don't watch that um, as a part of you know your normal League of Legends uh, consumption, definitely do that. Go watch the end of the TSM victory game three against Samsung White because uh, Loco Doco specifically references that. I don't want to call it prejudice, but that I guess uh, stereotype that when Korean players or even Chinese players come to North America, uh, what that does to their home, their home teams. It's an interesting, you know, obviously quick because those are never long, but it's a quick statement that he puts out. Well, I'm sticking shoes of League of Legends aside. <laughs> Cloud I'm is sticking... infinitely better than Dada Seven on a mechanical level, and I, if he has, still has that team synergy, um, like he used to in the regular season. I think he went sixteen and five. Uh, then we should. Uh, it should be a huge advantage for OMG, who's been ridiculously inconsistent up until this point. Do you think even with him though, they're really going to stand a chance against White Shield? Because I don't see it. So here's I've, the thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm sticking. White with Shield my also fiction. sucks. <laughs> White Shield also, despite Sucks. playing like gods, well, they did. Okay, let's, let's... they dropped two games. <laughs> they should not have dropped two games. They were they played amazing to qualify for Worlds, and I touched on this last week. But um, Jungle and their AD carry specifically, um, Zepha and Watch are both either do nothing, like absolutely nothing, or go go off and carry the team. And that kind of inconsistency in a best of five series is like is death. And this is the first series we're going to see um, White Shield play. And I'm hoping that they're going to bring their A game and they're going to win. But I think they have just as much chance to lose as OMG does at this point, given how inconsistent both of these teams play. I think we're going to see White Shield push through. I think there really is a lot of mentality that goes into this game uh, in terms of emotions and team dynamics. And if you're making changes, you know, going in, you've got bad blood brewing. I mean, OMG kind of has every reason to lose here. Um, where I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't know the dynamics of White Shield that well. But you've got, you know, your the other Korean representatives fighting over uh, their spot in the semifinals. I think if you want to be relevant, that's in your your uh region that's a that's a pretty strong motivation um i mean they've got a long road ahead of them white shield does and i think they will pull through over omg and and certainly over royal club um my original prediction which i'm staying with for the finals is going to be you know samsung white on on najin shield white on white i i hope for white on royal (laughs) Uzi versus Imp would be the greatest thing ever. I want to see it. I would watch those probably three games because I still think White's going to win over and over and over again. Win <laughs> three? Wow. Okay. I, I'm I, sure to be honest, I, I'm, not gonna, those... I'm, I'm not going to deny that, but I really hope that doesn't happen. I no, mean, I it, hope for five games too. I just yeah. I think objectively that Imp is just straight better than Uzi, and I know that Mata is just... Mata's, Mata's a god. Mata is the support god. He's undisputed the number one support in the world. And I think that they're just... If if Uzi is really better than Imp, they're just not going to team fight with, with right. Uzi. They're just not going to fall into that trap. They're going to split push. And I don't think Starhorn's going to be able to deal with that. I think Starhorn is a team fighting Uzi-based team. And I think when it comes down to hardcore macro game, uh, White's just going to beat them. As long as they don't get fall into that trap. But who knows? Maybe Imp has like a whole ton of ego on the line to prove he's number one and they're going to team fight over and over and over again. And it'll be this giant best of five bloodbath, which would be much better to watch, but is probably much less likely to earn Samsung White a victory. Right. I think what I want to do is I kind of want to go back and review, you know, all the games that have been played thus far and, and even do a little bit of a deeper research into the teams themselves find out who those clutch players or the clutch champions for each player is and find out who do I really want to buy the championship skins from uh, <laughs> in the coming weeks uh, as we move into season four because I'm pretty pumped that Fnatic brought Jarvan to the table That's I mean that's season one it's a completely different meta I think we're going to see <laughs> I don't know what champions we're going to see because they can't make another vein. So we'll get championship Kha'Zix. No matter what happens, we're getting championship Kha'Zix. I mean, championship Rumble. Championship Rumble, maybe. Championship Rise, Rise, maybe. You know, like the skins are pretty much going to be the same no matter who wins because there's only like 
one champion who's definitively the best in each role. Well, I wonder if they, I wonder if they will, and this is totally off topic, but I wonder if they, uh, if they will double dip. You know, if a champion stays relevant, um, you know, do you keep them? Do you keep them? <laughs> That's the question. I mean, I think we're, we would certainly, if if you're going to make that argument, uh, championship Twitch or Lucian. Mm. Well, I but mean, okay, rate, so Twitch. both these players have the same champion pool. They both really want to play Vayne, despite the fact that it's almost never the right choice. They both play Lucian, they both play Twitch, they both play Tristana when it's necessary. I mean, oh, these guys true, are true, both Tristana. hardcore AD carries. Like, both are hardcore AD carries. So they're going to play either a hyper carry or they're going to play Lucian to bully the other one out of lane. Um, and I think it really comes down to the supports in these lanes and who's going to perform better. And I think almost 100% sure that Mata is going to just bring it in. And Mata is going to help crush this bot lane. And I really hope that they don't lane swap. I really, really, really hope they don't lane swap. I want to see that 2v2 lane. They probably um, will lane swap, but not every game. I just, I, we will see as, at least one. Yeah. As long as I see it at least once, I think I'll be pretty content. But that is like that is the lane to watch, without a doubt. The rest of it... It's all very important, don't get me wrong, but I don't care. I just want I want to watch my support versus AD carry at the highest level. Like, literally the highest level. The two best AD carries in the world. The top support and whoever the heck is the support for Starhorn. <laughs> you know, play against each other. Sure. That's what well, I for those of you who have joined us in podcast world, you already know the answers to these burning questions that we uh, are asking ourselves as this does usually air on Tuesdays. So these have already all been decided, but let's take a look at the rest of the brackets and end this episode of uh, the show with our predictions. So let's start out with, uh, we'll even we'll even go dangerous here. Let's talk about tomorrow's game. Uh, Greg, give me your your white shield on OMG. White shield, definitely, probably four games. And then uh, on Starhorn. Uh, well, since Starhorn is my pick to win the tournament, I'm going to say Starhorn for sure. <laughs> Dan, um, same. It may go to five, but I would doubt it. Probably four. Dan, say- same. Same to you. White White Shield, uh, five games, almost definitely. And then I think uh, Starhorn versus... Wo- God, see, I really want to see these games to see if, if, if White shows <laughs> up. But Starhorn, because Starhorn is... Um, Uzi is ridiculously consistent, and I think he's going to he's going to dump on Zephyr when White inevitably gets through. So, uh, well, I'm going to I'm going to give it White on OMG in four, then White on Starhorn in five. Um, Semifinals, we already know me. I'm going white. Let's just facilitate this as easily as possible. Anybody on blue? <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't know what to expect. I think that uh, both teams have been really focused on playing like poke mid laners, and I don't know. I have no idea. I, here's what to champions expect. Play, uh, white is doing everything and blue is doing, but more consistently and a little bit better. I think if if Cloud9 can do what they did to Blue in game one, where you should go in with a a hard head and hit as hard as you possibly physically can, uh, and you let that happen to you, I think White destroys Blue in the first two. Blue maybe takes them in three, but it's close, and then Samsung just walks on four. I uh, I think that at the end of the day, it's just too much of a of a hyper carry meta, and I think Imp is just the better AD carry. But I think that Acorn's a better top laner. I like him better as a top laner, and uh, Dandy may be a better jungler, but I, I they're not going to give him Rengar, which I think is is the one pick that I think can he can carry a game with. So it's really up in the air for me, but I think you might be right in that it's it's leaning towards White for sure. It will be interesting to see how Imp on Def goes, and we'll see if Def, you know. Has to cry again. I don't. I didn't see what that whole thing was, but they kept referencing that throughout all of uh, all of Blue's games on how Def is going to cry. Spirit said he wasn't going to cry anymore. It was awkward. <laughs> Find out what that story is about someday. But uh, so I mean, I we'll leave the the predictions right there. We won't talk about finals just yet because at at that point you're. You're kind of forecasting on your own. Your I own, mean, uh, we did talk about finals, and we 
universally agreed. I think that Korea is going to win. The debate is if it's three games or five games. But we didn't universally we agree that Korea is going to win. I think I think yeah, World Greg Cup will beat White. I just don't, cannot I believe. Agree. Okay, all right. So we're not in universal agreement, but our opinions are out there, mixed yeah. into the rest of the podcast. We'll see. We'll see next week. Hopefully, uh, Mitch will be able to join us. Don't know about Optimus Tom. I mean, he's on he's on the stats desk, so he he's is. He's uh, in Korea working day and night for Riot to get coverage together for Worlds. So I don't yeah. think we'll see him in the next couple of weeks. But whatever you're watching on Worlds, you can thank him for the majority of the stats that are showing. Well, up. it's funny because if you watched one of Riot's um, most recent videos, they actually took that really cool. Uh, behind the scenes shoutcaster video that surfaced on Reddit, um, where it shows the three casters standing in front of their screen, uh, going through their their yeah. bit. Um, Riot did their own little you know thing about that, which was actually pretty interesting, sort of a behind the scenes. But they specifically reference the stats team. And they're like, yeah, the stats team works really hard and. You know, sometimes uh, we use like a small bit of their information if it fits into the game. Uh, and then it's, you know, they get their 20 seconds. And I'm like, that sucks. <laughs> well, Optimus Tom specifically, like he focuses on EU. For those of you who don't know, he's the EU, one of the EU stats people or the only one. I'm not sure. So it's a EU small didn't make team. it through. EU didn't make it through. So it's I don't know team. what stats he's getting, but I, I hope he's having a good time. And I, and I hope yeah. he's doing something fun. I think he's j- he's happy enough knowing that uh, Poppy was played. Oh yeah, one hundred percent win rate. World. <laughs> I think he can retire now. Oh, don't fire oh, him, Riot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, this has been episode thirty-two of the T Force LCS Rundown. Thank you for bearing with us oh, through. One our- sec, Mutt. Whoa. One sec. Pumping the brakes. Pumping the brakes here. I got something to ask our audience. Oh. We have questions. Live Two questions. days ago, I managed to break 800 followers on Twitter. I have no idea how many of that is people listening to the show or not, but i got to believe a few of them, and I want to thank you guys for that. But now the challenge is, can you get me over 1,000? 1,000. That is at G-R-R-U-S-S-O. Grusso. G-R-R-U-S-S-O. Hit me up on Twitter. Follow me. You'll get the best stuff Ever. Okay. Don't saying. bother following me on Twitter because I never use it. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do mine since we're all just pandering for Twitter followers. If you enjoy what I say and think that I'm better than Greg in any way, shape, or form, follow me on Twitter at LOL underscore CIFA. That's T-S-E-P-H-A. I don't tweet as many interesting things as Greg, but I have significantly less followers, so take pity on me. You know, that was I, a good point. <laughs> I I know the reason why I don't have that many followers, and it's because my name has been spelt wrong for so long on the whoa, screen. Whoa, whoa. Ma Gan Ram? <laughs> Come on, man. There's somebody <laughs> whose name is Ma Gan Ram on Twitter, and they have so many fucking followers, and they're just like, why do you never talk about League of Legends, man? Like, what's the deal? Yeah, well, I should have taken my my followers from the Instalock Mid podcast when I was hosting that because I had a lot there. It was fun, right. but now I'm going to really end the episode because you know we do that and it's it's kind of late. I got work in the morning, so this has been episode 32 of the T Force LCS Rundown. Thanks for joining us. For those of you joining on the Twitch chat, thank you for putting up with all of our technical buffoonery. Uh, it's a work in progress as. Uh, you know, I move and hashtag blame Comcast. So thanks for joining us. Uh, next week, we will be uh, reviewing the semifinal games. So we'll actually have all the games played at that point, which is always a helpful thing uh, when, you know, talking about the games to be played. So we'll be looking at finals. We'll start to maybe, uh, since there'll be less games, we might start talking about the current things that are going on in the home regions of North America and Europe, because there is plenty of drama a brewing. And uh, even though I was told not to shout them out anymore, you may wanna you may wanna be around for tomorrow night. I'm not gonna give any spoilers out, but uh, stick around to the old twitch.tv slash tforce podcast. Shit's gonna get real. We'll put it that way. 
All right. It's awesome.